you got to love each other anyway. Amen. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Pastor Tom's really spoke on a lot of things that um, God has already shared with me. Um, and I guess I just want to start off by, you know, that was what I was going to start off saying. I'm, you know, looking at this thing over the last couple of weeks, I was surprised at the response from my brothers and sisters. It was shock and awe. And, um, you know, when we look at what's going on, what the Lord took me to, and, and I really... I'm surprised at how this is affecting me. As a young black man, I'm naturally going to be upset um, over everything that's going on. But this is really, like, this has really been breaking me down the last couple of weeks from, like, the deepest part of my heart. Uh, it, it extended more than just my race as a black man. It's been affecting me as, as a man of God is what I realized. And um, when I really began to just uh, search the Lord and just, just partic- like, Lord, what's going on with me? Like, you know, I, I really didn't want to feel everything I was feeling. I really have just wanted to just dismiss it. And I've, it's been, I've been on a roller coaster of, you know, just trying to embrace this and understand it's like, you know, I don't, I got enough stuff of my own. I just really don't want to deal with this. And then, you know, one, you know, that's where God took me, and it's like, why, are, why am I surprised? And God took me to 2 Timothy um, 3, 1, It says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be violent, puffed up with pride, and, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So in that, it's just, you know, we're seeing, it's like Pastor Tom, we're seeing the end times, and we shouldn't be shocked by what, what is going on. Um, you know, another part of this that the Lord has been dealing with me on is identity, and I believe I have a, u- a unique identity in the perspective of everything that's going on, and, and first and foremost, that's my identity as a young black man. And uh, of course, seeing everything from that perspective and that identity which is what I was born into and what I always recognized myself as first and foremost in life, um, it was challenging. I was angry and uh, very upset at, at what I was seeing. And um, b- getting drawn into my emotions as a young black man because of what was going on, the incident itself, and not just George Floyd, you know, all of it and everything that's been going on. It took me back to times that I've had to deal with racism as a young black man, and it was a lot in anger. Um, but also, you know, it began to infect me from my identity as a young black man. I grew up in a small white town in Salem, New York. Um, my parents made a very bold move moving us up there. So as a young black man growing up in that community, I came up under a lot of, a lot of love of white Americans. You know, most of all my best friends are, are white guys. And there was a lot of women in that community that mothered me through a very broken and dark time in my age. So when I started seeing stuff on the news, that lady getting beat by, with two by fours, she, I, I just saw the face of so many beautiful white women that care for me and my sisters and brothers in a very difficult time, and it broke my heart. Um, and I began to get angry at the black community, and it was just, it, it was crazy. And, and then, you know, I left home and I joined the military. I understand brotherhood as a, as a man of service. I have a lot of guys I serve with who are now in law enforcement. And um, so when I started to see policemen attack, police stations burned, when I, I know the frustration and I understand the heart of servicemen. When we respond to a situation totally focused on the point of I have to defend my brothers, I have to defend the code, 
So from being a black man to a young black man raised under, in, in white America to a black man who became a patriot, who, who, who I would die for, this, for the flag, I would die for the nation. I don't believe in getting caught up in the politics and all those things, it's like I'm an American. And, and, and the oath that I made to defend this country against foreign and domestic threats, that's as serious to me today as it was the, the, the day I walked across Paris Island. So when I see policemen attacked and hit in the face with bricks, it was, it was devastating. And, and I was angry. I really, you know, you want to respond. Um, so this is just, it just got really personal for me. Um, but then God reminded me of my identity in Jesus Christ. And as he did that, it put everything in perspective. You know, because right now, I'm at a stage in my life where I'll always be a black man. I always, I can't, I, I, I came up, I came up in Salem, New York, and, and, and that part of my life will be a part of me as well. My military history and my, my, my pride and service to brotherhood, that'll be a part, always be a part of me. But superseding all of that for me right now is I'm a son of God. Amen. And um, the Bible tells us that our identity in Christ is part of accepting his gift of eternal life through faith. Jesus gave his life on earth and, and rose from the grave to conquer death and sanctify those who believe in him. When we become followers and believers in Jesus, we lose our identity of this world and embrace our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ is being a member of his holy body. Uh, 1 John eleven fourteen 14 says he came, to, he came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believe in him and accept him, he gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passions or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Um, and, and one of my favorites, and this is from the Passion Translation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything, everything, everything is fresh and new. The stigma of a, of a black man, a, a black man growing up in a white community, everything in my life was made new in Christ. My position as a son of God supersedes everything in my life. And that's who I have to be for those little boys. That's the perspective that I had to begin to take in this whole situation. That led me to, I'll tell you what, um, and, and when I got that revelation, it broke me. I'm telling you, it broke me so bad. I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday. I tried to spend time in my office, get myself together, go to work. I was a train, I was weeping. Weeping, it, it, it scared me the way I was weeping. I could not understand what was going on with me. I called my, one of my spiritual fathers, uh, Mr. Glover, and just like, you know, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm really trying to understand. I don't understand what's going on. I mean, I just went through that. I got, finally got myself together. I called Pastor Tom, talked to him a little bit. Finally was able to get myself together, go out to work. I didn't last an hour. And God really began to deal me, with me when I was working. And um, I just shut down, came home. Thank God Trina and the boys were gone. So I was home by myself. And in the midst of sitting in my house and just like, Lord, what is wrong with me? The Holy Spirit, Jesus, spoke to me and said, my heart is your heart. And in that instance, I believe what the Lord was telling me, he's like, I'm weeping right now. God's weeping over the whole thing. And, and I could relate as a man being in situations when life really punches you in the face and it just gets in you. And you go through this stage of just weeping over life and what is going on and how it's impacting you. God's weeping over the earth right now. But I also have experienced a back out of that where the, as a man, especially a man of God, when the weeping stops, you're ready to fix it. And you step into things with a, with a mindset and a tenacity to fix it. And God's going to fix it. He's coming. Um, but it's just, you, you know, God really dealt with me about how he's just weeping. And he's just not weeping over George Floyd. 
He's weeping over the police officer that had his knee on the man's neck. God's heart is breaking for that man. God's heart is breaking for the lady that's getting beat down in front of her store. God's heart's breaking for the black man that are beating her with a two by four. Because he just sees sin. He sees broken people. And I know the will of my father. His will is that all would be saved. That Derek Shavanaugh would be saved. That George Floyd would be saved. That all would be saved. Not some, but all. You know, and his, his heart's really weeping over everything that's going on and what he's, he's seeing. He's grieving over David Dorn. He's grieving over the men that shot him. And as Christians, we really have to get in perspective. We have to get connected with the Holy Spirit, and we've got to get our hearts and see this thing from, from, from the eyes and the heart of the Father. It has to take over our emotions and how we're thinking about things, and, how we're, and, and our thinking has to translate in how we're speaking about things. You know, I refuse as a young black man to get caught up into this political view, this political view as woe is me. Woe is, is, is black people, it's a race war, it's a heaven and hell war. It's a sin war. I want to share a, a little bit of a personal testimony of my own, just because I want to really give the perspective of what's being portrayed over the black community and young black men. Um, I shared that I grew up in New York and, and without, I wanna honor my family. It was, it was hard. You know, I grew up in a very abusive household. Seeing my sister raped and molested, chased out of the house. Me and my sisters and brothers were chased out of the house at gunpoint. Um, I remember days of being beaten where when I went to school, I'm sitting sideways at my desk because you know I'm in pain. Um, because there's this stigma over the black community that we have taken on a certain identity and a DNA has been inherited into us because of fatherness, because of brokenness. There's all these reasons why the black community stays in the state it does. I get it, I understand. My point to sharing some of the, my past and growing up, I know what it means to grow up fatherless. I haven't talked to my dad in years. Um, and I don't know what's worse, having a dad that just chooses not to be there or having a dad that's there but chooses not to be a part of your life. Either way, I know what it's like to grow up fatherless. Um, carrying all that grief for many years, it was such a roadblock. You know, I had a very stellar military career, but at every turn in my life, at everything I was doing, I, I seemed to hit this point where the baggage of my past would take over. And it would just get destructive, and I'd destroy my own life. And people are true. I think, you know, fatherlessness is huge in the black community, and um, it's, it's a big problem. You know, I got out of the Marine Corps and toting all those bags around, I made bad decisions. <laughs> I had my problems with law and, and, and breaking the law. I've had encounters with law enforcement. That wasn't good. And I, I remember two encounters where it was excessive because I was black. I don't know any other way to say it. Um, I've had times since I've been married to my wife where I believe the system was hard there than what it should have been. And I believe it was because I was black. The point is, as a young black man, I put myself in situations where I could have leaned on the system and said, racism, I'm not getting what I deserve. Um, and I have a reason. Because of my fatherness, because of my brokenness, because of my past, I have a reason for my conduct and actions. And because of what my people have been through, those reasons are justified. And I could have leaned on politics or government. I could have leaned on a lot of things and been in instances where I could have, could have, have, have stood on the side of injustice and racism. I believe the difference, I know the difference in me and a lot of young black men my age is choice. 
I have been in a situation and I sat there and I contemplated choosing the other path, choosing the path of, you know what, I'm a young black man, I've been through a lot, the system is not treating me right. And in the midst of contemplating that, I chose the other path. I chose to get on my knees and say, Lord, help me. I chose to come under the conviction of my, my own choices, my own conduct, and my own action. And I didn't ask God to fix the government. I didn't ask him to change laws. I said, Lord, you got to fix me. You have to fix me because I, just, I couldn't live the way I was living anymore. Um, and God showed up. He showed up and uh, he did everything he promised. You know, and I just believe, and I'm, what I'm seeing today, and I just want to speak directly into the, the black community and young men, we all have a choice. And um, the fight that is in front of, I think, you know, I'm not going to speak into the fight of racism. I want to say the fight we have in front of us to transform hearts and lives, to transform communities. It's not going to be one trying to change laws. It's not going to be one trying to pin blame on law enforcement or politics. It's going to be one by black men of influence who have chosen the right way, who have chosen to submit their heart and life to God, getting back into our own communities and holding young black men accountable. That's where the fight's gonna be won. That's where the difference is gonna be made. That's where the difference is gonna be made for all these young black girls growing up without, you know, having kids and don't have a father there. You know, I spent the weekend watching professional athletes, men of influence, and, you know, speaking and coming together. And I watched a message from T.D. Jakes and he spoke on it, the DNA of our people and how we are under this stigma in society of because of fatherness and because of brokenness that we can't stand. And we have to put the burden on our government. We have to put the burden on the white community to bring about change. Change started in my life by my choice. By my choice, by my decision. It didn't start by Steve Lambros coming into my life. It didn't start by Pastor Tom coming into my life and trying to save me. It started by me making a choice for Jesus Christ. And when I turned to Jesus and began to walk towards him, he put Pastor Tom in my life. He put Steve Lambros in my life. He put Pastor Willie in my life. He began to bring spiritual fathers alongside of me and remove the weight of fatherness. I wasn't without my mother, but he put Miss Hauser in my life who grabs my face like a mother and gives me the love of a mother every time she sees me, Miss Evelyn. So I just speak to the, to the black community. I speak to the black leaders. I speak to black men of influence. We, this, this fight we have, if we're gonna make it about change in the black community, just like it starts with every individual whether you're white, you're black, or you're Hispanic, change starts within your heart. And it affects the way you're thinking, it affects the way you're speaking, it, it, it changes the, the, the people and places and things you, you, you put yourself around. We have too many young black men, because of their choice, putting themselves in harm's way, putting themselves in the path of racism, putting themselves in violent situations. And I just believe, you know, we have to start preaching a message of accountability, a message of choice in the black community to young black men. You don't have to stay where you're at. You don't have to do the things you're doing. And it hasn't been easy for me. I can testify when me and Trina got married. It's just eight years ago. You know, I had a choice to make. And it was hard when we first got married. It was hard trying to take on the responsibility of being a father. I remember losing everything I had and Trina took me anyways. <laughs> God bless her. And in the process, and she doesn't know this to this day, I really contemplated going back to some people and doing some things to try to make money. And it's just like, I just got to get some breathing room. There again, I made a choice. I went and worked for a couple of white guys. Um, 
and they were country. <laughs> up on working for these guys, up on a roof, working hard. Fell off the roof, hurt myself very badly. These guys put me in the back of a truck, drove me to where Trina was working at, dumped me on the sidewalk and left. I had my, my L3, my L4 vertebrae were fractured. I tore my shoulder out of the rotator's cup. It was, it was a horrible experience. Honestly, speaking truth and being transparent, if I were a white guy, I think they would have handled it differently. I don't know any other way to say it. You know, and, but there again, in that moment, I remember laying on that couch in that little apartment we lived in at the time, just like, Lord, you know, what, what is going on? But there again, I had a choice. I had a choice to take the side of self-pity and woe is me, or I had a choice to look right into the heart of God and say, Lord, you got to help me. And again, God showed up. You know, and it wasn't easy. And I want to just, young black man, it's not going to be easy. You know, but God healed me up. I, I was able to get a good job. It wasn't making a lot, 10 bucks an hour, but I had to go out and do construction during the day, and I was going down to Riceville Beach to work in that restaurant at night till 1 o'clock in the morning for a long time. But as a young black man, I had a choice and a responsibility to lead my family. I had a choice every day to get up and trust God, who's not a magic wand, who just didn't tap my life and bring prosperity, and I had to go grind it out for a long time. And along the way, I'm just going to ask Trina, will you come up here? Because <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. Pastor Tom, will you come up? Pastor Willie, Miss Addie, will you come up here? I wish Miss Evelyn was here. Me and Trina have been through a lot. And I pray that we are a good, I don't play that we're good, I pray that we're a great representation for young blacks all over. You know, we're not celebrities, we're not superstars. Um, and it's been hard work. It's been a lot of hard work. God has done way more than we have, but it's been hard work. And I just, you know, what we're seeing and, and what's being preached to the black community, it, it just comes down to choice. It comes down to young, it comes down to, to, to black leaders. I consider myself a leader. We have to get into the black communities and we have to hold them accountable. You know, that's where the difference is going to make. We got to challenge young black men to make the right choice. I don't know any law in place today in America. I don't know any law enforcement governing agency or body that hinders me as a young black man from doing anything that I want to do, from reaching any level of success I want to reach. And I feel like as a young black man, I've been in some of the worst places. I've been down and out in the worst way without a dime in my pocket. And the only thing I had was the power of prayer and my choice to lean on Jesus every day. Amen. And he's made the difference in my life. He's allowed me to bring my family a long way. Amen. And um, it's not about race. And I look at, I call you guys up here because it's like Pastor Tom said, I see Hispanic, I see black, I see white. I see, I don't see God and I don't see, and I never noticed, I never noticed the color of people, Amen. Steve Lambros. Yeah. I just saw God putting people, good people, yes. Yes. people who set the example for us to love God with all our soul and might in our lives to help lead us, to help protect us, to help cover us, and to help move us forward. And we have a responsibility to you guys. I don't just have a responsibility to the black community. I have a responsibility to the people that God has put in my life to show them that the example they set to honor the Lord and love me and love my wife and love my family and support us, I have a responsibility to pay it forward. To them, 
to my generation, to the next generation. I will never teach. I will always want my boys to know, and we do a good job about trying to help our sons to understand their, their history as young black men. But more than anything, we teach our boys that they got to love God with all their whole, whole soul, heart, and might, that their identity is in Christ. That's, that's, that's the divide in their life. That's the power in their life. You know, and um, I hope when people see me and Trina that they see, I want them to see a beautiful black couple because that's what we are. She's more beautiful. She makes me beautiful. But, but greater than that, I want them to see two people that have submitted their heart and their life to the Lord who love God, who do their best to honor God in every way, who aren't perfect, but do their best to just honor God in every way. And I want them to see how it blesses us. I want to see how it brings increase because unless this is a lie, this right here tells me that my family doesn't have to worry about racism. My family doesn't have to worry about, I don't care if the laws get worse. This right here tells me that me and my family will be blessed all the days of our life if we commit our heart and honor God no matter what happens. If I encounter racism, if I encounter bigotry, this tells me no matter what I encounter, God is greater than it all and supersedes everything in my life. In Jesus' name. Yeah, just have a seat. We're going to have take communion. I think it'd be good to really seal the day with communion. Um, the message that uh, 